Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1, 1 is a definitive statement of the origin of space and time and matter. In the beginning, time, God created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, matter. When I was a little boy, my grandmother told me this. She told me that the Bible was the word of God, that God had created me, that Jesus was the Son of God and himself the very creator of the universe. And I said, I believe. The other view, presented by Carl Sagan in his book, Cosmos. The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Or ever will be. There are no gods, there are no angels, there are no extra-dimensional realities. What you see is what you get. The universe is all there is. As a child, I believed in creation. I believed as a young child that indeed God did make me, that the Bible was the word of God, and that Jesus was the creator of the universe, and the savior and the redeemer of mankind. But as I got into about fourth or fifth grade, I remember one of my teachers told me, no, God didn't make you. You're the product of chance, the product of random molecular movement. I was shown a chart with a little furry ape-like guy dragging his knuckles on one side of the chart. He got gradually bigger and bigger and bigger and walked off the other end of the chart, fully grown man with his hair all fallen off. And I was told, this is how you got here, by the process of evolution. I was told that I evolved from the goo to you by way of the zoo over three and a half billion years. I lost my faith. What happened was, essentially, was that nobody in my family gave me reasons for the hope that was in them. No one gave me, no one armed me with any, uh, you know, information to show me why there was a God, why the Bible was the word of God, and why Jesus was who the Bible said he was. And so I lost my faith. I was inundated by the world with all of the uh, evidence for, supposed evidence for evolution, and by the time I was in junior high, I was a convinced evolutionist. Graduated from high school, uh, went to college, majored in biology, and in biology was, majored in, uh, when I majored in biology, I was absolutely indoctrinated in evolutionary thinking. I was told, young man, if you're going to believe if you're going to get anywhere in uh, the biological sciences, you need to just accept evolution as a fact. It is the foundational truth upon which biological sciences are built. Went to medical school, got to dissect an entire human cadaver from head to toe as a medical student. It's a great experience. And I remember sitting there holding <laughs> kidneys and eyeballs and hearts and lungs and thinking, wow, billions of years of random molecular movement did this. Wow. But you know what? I always had a little tiny bit of doubt. But that doubt was suppressed. It was way suppressed because of all of the PhDs and all of the MDs and all of these, the way in which it was presented. It's a fact. The evidence is everywhere, I was told. And so I remained an evolutionist for many, many years. Well, at the age of 29, after graduating from medical school and finishing my residency, I was a young doctor on fire for a BMW and a tax problem. <laughs> and God stopped me in my tracks. He allowed a lot of circumstances to occur in my life that caused me to begin to search, to search for God, to, as Chuck said, I began to think. I was outside of that intimidating environment where I was told it was true, and I had to believe it, and I began to research and study. A number of Christian doctors had seen that my life was a mess. I was uh, a dysfunctional physician, as they would say. I was a mess. And they saw it. And a number of Christian physicians got in my face. I remember one guy literally got me up against a wall. I couldn't go left. I couldn't go right. I couldn't go back. And he was telling me, Mark, there's a creator. There's evidence for creation. You need Jesus in your life. And I'm smiling, thinking, oh, thank you. I'm saying, oh, well, thank you very much for sharing that with me. And inside I'm saying, get away from me, you ignorant fool. But he challenged me. He said, look, I want you to read some of the books by Henry Morris. And he mentioned some, some guys I'd never heard of and search the evidence for creation. I want you to read the Gospel of Luke. He was a physician. And then go to the Gospel of John. And he challenged me to search the evidence. And so 
You know, there's a saying, when you're flat on your back, you can only look up. (laughs) Well, I was flat on my back at that time. And so I remember one day I went in my front yard, got a plastic chair, sat on this chair. Here I was, a dirt clod sitting on a plastic chair. And I looked up in the sky and I said, God, if you're up there, prove it to me. I need evidence. I need evidence. Within a few weeks, a number of things started happening. I was given a two-part tape series by a lovely British gentleman named Dr. A.E. Wildersmith. The tape series was done right here at Costa Mesa. It's called Evolution, Creation, Theistic Evolution. I put that tape series inside my cassette player, sat in my backyard, put my headphones on, propped my feet up on the chair, tape one, side A, and hit play. Before I turned it over to side two, this gentleman had wiped out the scientific foundation of an education that cost me $150,000 with a 35 cent plastic cassette. Was I ticked? I hadn't even turned it over to t- side two, side B of tape one yet. That was my lightning bolt experience. My lightning bolt experience. You know, it's funny, I met him a few years later. Of course, Dr. A.E. Waldersmith, who Pastor Chuck and the Word for Today have published so many of his books. I was just in awe to meet this man because of what he had done. He had allowed me to start to think. And I met him a few years later, and I, and I was so excited. I drove him around to a few speaking engagements, and I said... Professor Waldersmith, I said, um, I'm a medical doctor, and uh, I've you know, got an MD degree, and, I, and, I, and I, what would you recommend a young man like me do if uh, I wanted to do a creation ministry? And he says, you have an MD degree, do you? And remember, this is a man who's got three earned doctorates, okay? Half a dozen full professorships. He's written, you know, 35 books, published 60 papers. He wasn't impressed. (laughs) He says, you have an MD degree, do you? And I said, well, yes, I do. He says, do you have anything else? (laughs) I said, high school diploma? (laughs) He said, well, what I would recommend you do is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul and get a PhD in molecular biology. (laughs) And so that was sort of the beginning of of what God was doing in my life. And I just am so thankful that Calvary Chapel published A.E. Wildersmith's works because he truly has changed my life and the lives of many thousands of skeptics and PhDs and MDs, which means mentally deficient, if you didn't know that, (laughs) as well. And what I'd like to do tonight is share some of the evidences that changed my life and convinced me indeed that the evolutionary worldview is wrong. Romans 1, 19 through 20 says, For since the creation of the world, his, that is God's invisible attributes, are clearly seen, being understood in the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. An incredible statement that by examining the things that are made, we can actually apprehend, we can actually comprehend some of the aspects of God's nature, some of his invisible aspects. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to know, God, if you are real, if you're there, I want the evidence, I want to know who you are, I want to know your nature and what your purpose for my life is. What I'd like to do tonight is start with the issue of the origin of the universe. The Bible said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We have a creator who existed before space, time, matter, and energy, existing outside of time and space, according to the Bible. And he caused the creation of space, time, and matter, and energy. It was a radical claim 3,500 years ago. It was a radical claim to state that the universe actually had a beginning. During the time that the Bible, during biblical times, most philosophers, most... uh, Uh, skeptic atheist philosophers believed that the universe was eternal. In fact, it was believed that the universe was eternal, that space and time and matter had always existed up until just the 20th century. Beginning in 1905, all that began to change. 
Albert Einstein published his special theory of relativity. Mathematically, this theory predicted that the universe was apparently expanding away from a point of origin, that the universe actually had a beginning. Secondly, Albert Einstein's theory demonstrated that time is actually a thing. It's actually a physical property of the universe, and that the flow of time is dependent on velocity, acceleration, and local gravity effects. Time can be compressed or stretched. Time, according to Einstein's theory, had a beginning. This is a statement by Paul Davies in his book about time. Paul Davies is an atheist who has written many books on the nature of the universe from an atheistic perspective. Here's what he said. Modern scientific cosmology is the most ambitious enterprise of all to emerge from Einstein's work. When scientists began to explore the implications of Einstein's time for the universe as a whole, they made one of the most important discoveries in the history of human thought. That time, and hence all of physical reality, must have had a definite origin in the past. If time is flexible and mutable, as Einstein demonstrated, then it is possible for time to come into existence and also to pass away again. There can be a beginning and an end to time. In his book, It's About Time, 1995, page 17. So the universe, we now know in this century, space, time, matter, and energy had a beginning. Robert Jastrow, a man who is a NASA astronomer, describes himself as an agnostic, wrote a book called God and the Astronomers in 1978. And on page 11, he said this, I am fascinated by some strange developments going on in astronomy, partly because of their religious implications and partly because of their peculiar partly because of the peculiar reaction of my colleagues. The essence of the strange developments is that the universe had, in some sense, a beginning, that it began at a certain moment in time. In his book, God and the Astronomers, he compiled and summarized the evidence that accumulated from the time of Einstein up to 1978, and the conclusion was that the universe had a beginning, that space and time and matter, space, time, matter, and energy, indeed, had a beginning. In 1989, he wrote another book called Journey to the Stars, and he said this, Most remarkable of all, astronomers have found proof that the universe sprang into existence abruptly in a sudden moment of creation, as the Bible said it did. Now, it's interesting, when you look at the writings of astronomers and astrophysicists, many of them are pointing out that the Bible seems to be the only holy book that got it right, that space and time and matter and energy indeed had a beginning. Now, what do they say happened? Well, they took all this evidence, the idea that the universe is expanding away from a point of apparent origin, and they came up with a theory called the Big Bang Theory. The idea is that space and time and matter and energy were compressed into an infinitely dense ball of matter that they called the cosmic egg. They claimed that this cosmic egg developed an instability, and then it suddenly exploded. They don't know where it happened, They don't really know when it happened. They don't know why it happened or how it happened, but they just claim that it happened. Well, the big question is this. Where did the cosmic egg come from? (laughs) Where did the matter come from that gave rise to the entire universe? You see, what they say is this, folks. It's amazing. They say, in the beginning there was nothing, then it exploded. There was nothing, then there was something, and then it exploded. But they never explain where did the matter come from that supposedly gave rise to the Big Bang. The problem is, is where there is a cosmic egg, there must be a cosmic chicken. (laughs) And they know this. And they know this. Many astronomers and many astrophysicists have indeed become believers in the existence of God because of this fact. The second piece of evidence is that in the last 25 years, scientists, astronomers, cosmologists have noticed dozens of design features in the nature of the universe that are so finely tuned that they're saying that it just doesn't seem like it's possible that it could be an accident. This is an article from Time, I'm sorry, from Newsweek magazine. Physicists have stumbled upon signs that the cosmos is custom made for life and consciousness. 
It turns out that if the constants of nature, that is the unchanging numbers like the strength of gravity, the charge of an electron, the mass of a proton, were the tiniest bit different, then atoms would not hold together, stars would not burn, and life would never have made an appearance. When you realize that the laws of nature must, must be incredibly fine-tuned to produce the universe we see, that conspires to plant the idea that the universe did not just happen, but that there must be a purpose behind it. John Polkinghorne, physicist from Cambridge University in Newsweek, July 20th, 1998. And where there's a purpose, folks, there's a purposer. Correct? And so the universe had a beginning. The universe is so finely tuned that cosmologists and astrophysicists and many are stating that it must have been designed. Finally, Robert Jastrow in his book, God and the Astron Astronomers, on page 116 said this. After summarizing the evidence that had accumulated in the uh, 20th century, he said, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> Space, time, matter, and energy had a beginning, and the implications are obvious. Let's next talk about the origin of life. For me, this is where I had my first lightning bolt experience when I was listening to that A.E. Wildersmith tape. The intelligent design formula, the idea that life was intelligent, intelligently designed, says that matter, coupled with energy, coupled with information, blueprints, know-how, biochemical expertise, all of these are forms of information is what is required to produce living systems. That's the intelligent design formula. The evolution formula for the origin of life is quite different. It says that matter combined with energy combined with chance chemistry, the random combining and uncombining and recombining of molecules, atoms over billions of years is what took to create living systems. Well, what I'd like to do today is let's look at what science tells us. Let's not deal with speculation. Let's look at actual scientific knowledge and see where does it take us and what does it tell us about the nature of chemistry, of physics, and the likely origin of living systems. First of all, let's talk about the nature of living systems. Living systems have the ability to self-produce. They can make copies of themselves. Single-celled organisms can multiply in 20 minutes, make a copy of themselves. Bacteria in 15 to 20 minutes can make a copy, a fully complete copy of itself. Living systems have the ability to store and retrieve information. The storage and retrieval of information is necessary in order to make copies of yourself. You have to have an instruction manual to refer to in order to make a copy. And indeed, living systems have information storage and retrieval systems that we'll talk about. Living systems have the ability to utilize energy from the environment to perform work. They can extract from the environment sugars and fats and various chemicals, bring them into their uh, structures, utilize these chemicals in order to uh, extract energy for the purpose of performing the work of reproduction and the work of metabolism, the work of life. And thus, living systems fulfill the definition of a machine. The definition of a machine is given by Nobel laureate Jacques Manaud. A machine is a purposeful aggregate of matter that uses energy to perform work. A collection of matter that is able to pull in energy from the environment and perform some form of work. That's the definition of a machine. And living systems all the way down to the molecular level fulfill this definition. So what, would an, what does an adequate explanation for the origin of life, what would it require? Well, first of all, it'd have to be able to explain the origin of molecules so complex that they cannot be produced by molecular biologists and chemists. We have molecules in our body that are so complex that today, with all of our biochemical knowledge and expertise, cannot be produced from the elements of the ground by molecular biologists and chemists. And yet, they want us to believe 
that a lightning bolt striking a puddle did it? All the molecular biologists and chemists in the world cannot create many of the molecules that are in our systems. Well, an adequate explanation for the origin of life must be able to explain how these complex molecules came into existence. Next, an adequate explanation must be able to explain the origin of information, the origin of the codes and the programs that are found inside of living systems. And finally, they must be able to explain the origin of machines. Any explanation that is going to suffice to explain the origin of life must be able to explain these three things. There is a theory called spontaneous generation. Spontaneous generation. It looks like I'm having spontaneous degeneration here on the computer. <laughs> Let's try that again. Oh, boy. Okay, well, don't you love technology? There's a theory called spontaneous generation. Tim will fix this later. <laughs> There's a theory that called spontaneous generation that says that life arose from, from non-living, inanimate matter. It was first proposed by a man by the name of Anaximander, who was a Greek philosopher in the 6th century BC. In the Middle Ages, people believed in spontaneous generation. People believed that microbes could arise spontaneously in their broths and soups because they noticed that if they left their soup out for several days, there'd be critters growing in their soup. <laughs> they believed that rats arose from trash because they noticed if you leave the trash out in the back for several days, rats show up in the trash. And they believed that fruit flies arose spontaneously from aging fruit because if you leave fruit around a few days, flies show up. Spontaneous generation. Darwin embraced the idea of spontaneous generation. He said that he believed that in some little warm pond that proteins and chemicals came together by chance and formed the first living systems. The theory was then tested in 1953 by Stanley Miller, as we'll see. 1953 was a very important year. 1953, these two gentlemen, James Watson and Francis Crick, deciphered the structure of the DNA molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is the molecule that, that carries all of the information to produce all of the structures in all of the living systems on planet Earth, deoxyribonucleic acid. They won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. The DNA molecule consists of two chains of building blocks called nucleotides. These two chains are bonded together by these hydrogen bonds. They're the yellow bonds there you see. And then like a ladder with its two rungs, it is then twisted on itself. It's a highly complex molecule, three-dimensional molecule. It's a double spiral helix, it's called. The second thing that happened in 1953 was a man by the name of Stanley Miller, working as a graduate student with Harold Urey, did an experiment to test the idea of spontaneous generation. What he did was he created an apparatus, a glass apparatus, in which he circulated a bunch of gases, including ammonia, methane, and water. And he had a spark device, uh, you see on the left there, that was to simulate the lightning in the supposed early atmosphere of planet Earth. He would circulate these gases through this contraption and spark it and then collect the uh, chemicals in the bottom in what he called the amino acid trap down there on the bottom. Stanley Miller performed this experiment and was able to produce some rather mar remarkable products. The number one product he produced was actually tar. You know, the stuff they make streets out of. The black gooey stuff. Tar is basically millions and millions and millions of carbon atoms strung together and of course play no role in living systems. The second major product of this experiment was 13%, tar was 85%. Uh, the second component was 13% carboxylic acids that are not found in living systems. And the third component that he made was one of the amino acids, which is a building blocks of protein called glycine. And the next one was alanine. Glycine was 1.05% and alanine was 0.85%. Now, the scientific community went crazy because Stanley Miller had produced two of the building blocks of life, two amino acids, two of the building blocks of proteins produced allegedly by chance in this spark chamber. But did he really use chance? It turns out that the first time he did it, he got no products relevant to life. 
Then using knowledge, a knowledge of physical chemistry, he adjusted the experimental conditions, optimized them knowing how to optimize the conditions to produce amino acids. He reran his experiment, and then using information, energy, and matter, what did he produce? Two of the building blocks of life. So did he prove that it takes that, that random chance can produce living systems? No. He proved that if you use enough information and know-how, you can produce building blocks of life. So he proved the creation formula is right. <laughs> Robert Shapiro, a chemist from New York, he's not O.J. Simpson's attorney, <laughs> uh, wrote a book called Origins in 1986. And he summarized the results of the Miller-Urey experiment. He said, let us sum up. The experiment performed by Miller yielded tar as its most abund abundant product. There are about 50 small organic compounds that are called building blocks for living systems, and only two of these 50 occurred among the preferential Miller-Urey products. So out of the 50 chemicals necessary, using biochemical expertise and know-how, he was only able to produce two of them using the spark and soup methods. Robert Shapiro also said this. Um, when I was in medical school, let me back up. When I was in medical school, I was told that these spark and soup type experiments had actually been successful in producing the building blocks of DNA, which are called nucleotides. In fact, my biochemistry book, uh, Leninger's biochemistry book, actually said that that the building blocks of DNA and RNA called nucleotides had been produced by such experiment. Well, Robert Shapiro reviewed the data on, these, uh, on this uh, alleged uh, production of nucleotides, and he said this. Regarding nucleotides of DNA and RNA, they have never been reported in any amount in such sources, meaning spark and soup sources. Yet, a mythology has emerged that maintains the opposite. I have seen several statements in scientific sources which claim that proteins and nucleic acids have themselves been prepared. These errors reflect the operation of an entire belief system. It's called atheism. The facts do not support this belief. Such thoughts may be comforting, but they run far ahead of any experimental validation. Robert Shapiro in his book, Origins, 1986, page 108 and 109. Some of the problems with the Miller-Urey experiment. First of all, he made a lot of chemical junk, the carboxylic acids and the other chemicals in there. And the problem is, is that that chemical junk bonds to amino acids far more effectively than it bonds to, than amino acids bond to themselves. So the amino acids, even if he was able to make them, would be bonded chemically and inactivated by bonding to all the chemical junk that was created. The next problem is the problem of molecular chirality. And this is the problem, this is the lightning bolt that A.E. Wildersmith used to just completely convince me that spontaneous generation was wrong. It turns out that the building blocks of life, amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA and RNA, occur in right and left-handed forms. Just as, just as though my hands are right and left-handed, they are mirror images of each other, the building blocks of proteins and nucleotides indeed are, exist in right and left-handed forms. Now, it turns out that our proteins are 100% made of 100% left-handed amino acids, and our nucleotides and our DNA are 100% right-handed. Well, there's a picture of, uh, of an amino acid with its mirror image uh, relative there. They're mirror images of each other. Now. Proteins in all living systems, as I mentioned, are made of 100% L-amino acids. DNA and RNA are made of 100% right uh, or dextronucleotides. Here's the problem. When Stanley Miller made his spark and soup solution, he made equal portions of left-handed and equal portions of right-handed amino acids. 50% of the glycine that he made was left and 50% was right-handed. Now. All of the people that have repeated Miller's experiment, all of the people that have tried to repeat his experiment over the years have been able to produce a variety of different amino acids, but they've always done the same thing. They've produced equal portions of left and right-handed amino acids. Here's the problem. Proteins and DNA are built by adding one amino acid or one nucleotide at a time to an ever-lengthening chain. 
The spontaneous generation worldview wants us to believe that amino acids, that left-handed amino acids, only left-handed amino acids, were extracted out of a soup exclusively from a soup that it consisted of 50% left and 50% right-handed amino acids. It's a mathematical impossibility. If you're going to blindfold yourself and reach into a bucket and pull out one amino acid, you have a 50-50 chance of getting a right or a left-handed one. Every time you do that, it's about a 50-50 chance of pulling out a right or a left-handed amino acid. So what kind of proteins are you going to get? You're going to get proteins which are long strands of amino acids bonded to each other. The proteins are going to consist of basically 50% left-handed and 50% right-handed amino acids. And yet you and I, our proteins are 100% left-handed. So it's a mathematical impossibility that a soup consisting of 50% left and right-handed building blocks could produce the molecules that living, that living systems possess. It cannot happen. If you're building a protein consisting of left-handed amino acids and you get one right-handed amino acid into the right place of the protein, it will entirely destroy the function of that protein. And so it's mathematically absurd to believe that you can get pure left-handed amino acids in your proteins or pure right-handed nucleotides in the DNA molecules from a soup that is 50-50. Chance chemistry will never produce or separate the right and the left-handed building blocks from each other. Chance chemistry will never do it. In fact, this issue of how did the primordial soup give rise to such pure molecules has been the subject of scientific symposiums. And they've concluded that, sci that, that random chance, what they call stochastic chemistry, will never produce the kinds of proteins and amino acids, the kind of proteins and nucleic acids that we see. The only way to separate the right and the left-handed amino acids is with biochemical expertise. It can be done, but it requires know-how. And biochemical expertise comes only from a mind. Now let's talk about the origin of the software. Living, the DNA molecule is part of the hardware, what I call the hardware of living systems, and it has software, instructions, codes, and programs called the genetic code that is carried by the DNA molecule. When you look at the genetic code, the code of life found in all living systems, the genetic code is digital. That is, it is mathematical. It's expressible in mathematical terms. The genetic code is also error correcting. When a DNA molecule makes a copy of itself and produces two daughter molecules, there's two proteins called DNA polymerase 2 and 3 that feel the new molecule. And if it finds an incorrectly placed building block, it pulls it out and puts the correct one in. It's an error-correcting digital mathematical information storage and retrieval system. And it's redundant. There are segments of DNA which are so critical that they occur two or three places in the genetic code. So that if a mutation occurs in the primary segment of DNA called a gene, that one will be turned off and a backup segment is turned on. So this is a digital, error-correcting, redundant information storage and retrieval system. Not only that, the information is overlapping. There are segments of DNA that have been discovered that can code for the production of more than one protein. Imagine this. Imagine you write out, an, imagine the task of writing out a sentence in English that's, say, a hundred letters long. That's an intelligible, intelligible sentence, and you have all the spaces there. Then you squish the letters together, change the position of the spaces, and you have an entirely different, also intelligible English sentence. Could you do that? Huh, it'd be pretty hard, right? Well, that's the way the DNA molecule is. There are segments of DNA that can code for two entirely different, uh, two entirely different proteins. This kind of information system is vastly, vastly more complex than what computer scientists can do today. So let's talk about the origin of codes and programs. Where do codes and programs come from? According to evolutionary biologists, the genetic code, the genetic code, the DNA molecule and its code arose by the random combining and uncombining of non-living chemicals. From the goo to the zoo, by, but to you by way of the zoo, as I said. Random chance is what did it. However, according to the principles of information science, if you leave the biology department, go down to the computer science department, find a 
senior computer programmer and ask him where do codes and programs and language conventions come from, they will tell you that they arise only as a result of intelligent contrivance. Chance will never produce a code, a program, or a language convention. In fact, chance is destructive to codes and programs. You know, if chance could produce codes and programs and, and language conventions, all we'd have to do, Bill Gates, all he'd have to do is hire a bunch of three-year-olds, blindfold them, and sit in front of computers and just type so they can get, you know, Microsoft Word 2002 or whatever, right? <laughs> but it doesn't happen that way. Random keystrokes on a computer are destructive to codes and programs. There was a Titan rocket that was um, launched in 1997, and it veered off course, and they had to explode it. When they examined the data afterwards, they found out that a single comma had been incorrectly placed amongst millions of lines of code, and that single comma in that code caused the, caused the uh, Titan rocket to veer off course. Chance does not produce information. It destroys information and all computer scientists will tell you that chance is the opposite of information if you think about information uh, computer scientists will tell you that the chance is the antipole or the opposite of information in fact when they write a computer program they do everything they can to make sure that chance plays no role in the development of a code or a program and languages are devised by at least two intelligent to at least two intelligent beings using arbitrary rules and regulations. Let's talk about the nature of information. The shape of the letters in a book, the shape of iron atoms on a floppy disk, the molecules in the DNA molecule have no intrinsic meaning. If you write down your name and just pick out one of the letters out of your name and look at it, just stare at that letter for a while. Does it actually convey any information? No. We assign meaning. Think about my name, Mark. Mark, 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 Mark. Is there any information actually conveyed by that sound? No. We assign meaning to that to that sound. We assign it. Right? So shapes of letters, iron atoms. Molecules on a DNA, uh, nucleotides on a DNA molecule, although they don't possess intrinsic meaning, they can carry meaning when used in a pre-existing language convention. The meaning of a sequence of letters, beads on a string, knots on a rope, sounds of one voice, or any story, storage system is determined by a pre-existing language convention rules and regulations that at least two intelligent beings uh, agree upon. Language conventions are always the result of intelligent contrivance, that is, a mind. Now some of you in the room look at that and that conveys information. You see dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 and you know what that means. Others of you see three dots, three dashes and three dots, you see that there's order in the sequence because, but because you don't have a knowledge of the language rules and regulations of the Morse code, no information is conveyed. It is, these dots and dashes have no intrinsic meaning. Meaning is conveyed when you have an understanding of the rules and the regulations. In the Morse code, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot means SOS. Dr. Eastman's in trouble help. But the only way you'd know that is by, not by looking at the dots and dashes, but by understanding that they can, they, they, we assign, we assign meaning to these non-random sequences. Let's say you and I want to invent a new language. Chuck doesn't know this, but I've actually earned, learned quite a bit of information science from Pastor Chuck Smith. Let's say we want to start a, a new language convention. And we decide that the word ugh means let's go to the malt shop and have a chocolate malt. And then we decide that nug means okay, I'll meet you there. And lug means I'm buying. And we're in a room of 2,000 people and I stand up over there and I go ugh. And everybody else in the room goes what? Huh? What's, what's that guy doing? And you stand up and you say, Nug! And everybody looks at that person and says, oh, 
what's with these two guys? And then I say, Lug. And you and I, with a smile, go walk out and go over to the corner and get a chocolate malt. <laughs> Was information conveyed between the two of us? Yeah. Why? Because we had an understanding, a pre-existing understanding of the language convention, the rules and regulations of the language convention. The rest of you are going, what was that all about? Why? Why don't you understand? Because you have no knowledge of the rules and the regulations of this new language convention. So, the point is, is that where there are codes and programs, where there are language conventions, where there is information, especially mathematical, error-correcting, redundant, overlapping information, there must be a mind. Next, let's talk about the odds, the mathematical odds of the origin of life. Imagine a primordial soup with all of the chemicals, the building blocks inside of a soup. This is what chemist Harold Morowitz from Yale University did. He imagined a chemical soup with all of the necessary chemicals to build a living system. And he imagined that this soup would, by chance, chemically combine given an infinite amount of time, what would be the mathematical probability that the chemicals would reassemble themselves into a bacterial organism? In his book, Energy Flow in Biology in 1968, he calculated that the chance was one chance in 10 to the 100 billionth power. A 10 with 100 billion zeros after it? An incredible, incredible number. Sir Fred Hoyle, a mathematician and astronomer, also calculated the probability of the origin of life and wrote an article in Nature November 12, 1981. And he said the chance that higher life forms might have emerged in this way, that is by random chance, is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a, young, a junkyard could assemble a, seven, a Boeing 747 from the material therein. It isn't going to happen, folks. It isn't going to happen. In his article in 1981 in Nature, he said the likelihood of the formation of life from inanimate matter is one to a number with 40,000 knots, that is, zeros after it. It is enough to bury Darwin and the whole theory of evolution. If the beginning of life were not random, they must therefore have been the reproduct of purposeful intelligence. Sir Frederick Hoyle, Nature, Volume 294, 1981. Consider that to win a state lottery, you have a chance of about one chance in 10 to the seventh power. Now. What are the odds of winning the state lottery every single week of your life from age 18 to 99? One chance in 4.6 times 10 to the 29,000th, 120th power. Harold Morowitz said it was one chance in 10 to the 100 billionth power. Mathematicians tell us that any event that has a probability that is less likely than one chance in 10 to the 50th power is a miracle. Morowitz said, one chance in 10 to the 100 billionth power. Now, I was doing a talk like this one time at a university, and several professors were in attendance. And one of the professors said, well, someday, mankind is going to produce a living system. We're going to make life in the laboratory, and we're going to show that you don't need God. In effect, what he was saying is, we're going to be able to disprove someday the creation formula. But is that how they'll do it? No. They'll have billions of dollars, hundreds of PhDs in molecular biology and chemistry. They'll use matter and energy and the information of all these scientists collectively to produce a living system. Information in the form of biochemical know-how. So which formula will they prove? They'll prove that you need a lot of knowledge to produce a living system and that the creation formula is right. If they wanted to do it by chance, they should just like put a bunch of chemicals in a building and explode it and see if that does it. Obviously, it's not going to happen that way. Now, I mentioned to you that living systems are machines. The machines are purposeful aggregates of matter that use energy to perform work, as Jacques Manaud said. When you look at living systems, you see that the complexity in living systems is just unbelievable. Think about the human visual system. There are at least 15 or 20 major subsystems dozens and dozens of subsystems below that, all of which, all of which use energy to perform work to do the work of sight, and all of which must be present in order for the system to work as a whole. You see, the problem is, is that an 80% evolved visual system 
It doesn't give you 80% vision. It gives you 0% vision. Now, let's talk about the human eye. This is an article in Byte magazine. It says, while today's digital hardware is extremely impressive, it is clear that the human retina's real-time performance goes unchallenged actually to simulate 10 milliseconds of the complete processing of even a single nerve cell from the retina would require the solution of about 500 simultaneous nonlinear differential equations 100 times. Whoa, no wonder your eyes are so tired at the end of the day, huh? <laughs> You've been doing trillions and trillions of calculus calculations all day long. And he says, and it would take at least several minutes of processing time on a Cray supercomputer, keeping in mind that there are 10 million or more such cells interacting with each other in complex ways. It would take a minimum of 100 years of Cray supercomputer time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times every second. John Stevens, Reverse Engineering of the Brain, Byte Magazine, April 1985. Incredible. Now, Cray supercomputers are a lot faster now than they were in 1985. Now it would probably only take 10 years <laughs> to simulate what your eyes do in less than one second. Think about the human brain. Human brain has been called by evolutionists the most complex structure in the universe. It weighs about 3.5 pounds, has the consistency of a meatloaf. <laughs> it, has more, it has more electrical connections than all of the electrical than all of the electrical connections and all of the appliances and all of the computers and all of the phones on earth, one brain. Okay. It calculates in petaflops, which is billions times billions of floating point operations per second. That's billions of times faster than any computer built by man. It runs at 98 degrees Fahrenheit and it runs on potatoes. <laughs> or tacos, or burritos, or chimichangas, you name it. It's an incredible, incredible piece of machinery. It's a machine. It's an aggregate of matter that uses energy to perform work, the work of thought, the work of metabolism, and on and on. Michael Denton, in his book, Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, talked about the machine-like structure of living systems. He said this, Although the tiniest bacterial cells are incredibly small, weighing less than 10 to the minus 12 grams, each is in effect a veritable micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery made up altogether of 100,000 million atoms, far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. Michael Denton, Evolution, A Theory, and Crisis, 1986, page 250. He's saying that a single amoeba, we're talking pond scum, is more complex than a Cray supercomputer or a space shuttle. Incredible complexity. So when you go outside tomorrow and you step on that bug on the sidewalk, shame on you. You've just wiped out a machine more complex than the space shuttle. Incredible, vast, vast complexity in living systems. Now. How does one make a machine? Evolutionary biologists teach that biological machines arise by chance, the random combining of molecules over billions of years. But according to the principles of engineering, all machines begin first as a concept. A concept is a thought. A concept is information. Let's say I wanted to make a machine that I could come home at night and stick my foot in my feet in this box and this box would like clean my feet and massage my feet and you know, clip my toenails and clean out the toe jam between my toes. <laughs> It'd be a pretty cool machine to have, right? Now, where did that machine begin? It began first as a concept. All machines begin as a concept. Machines do not arise by chance. And where do concepts come from? They come from a mind. The chance combining of matter is destructive to machines. There's not an engineer in this room that would honestly stand up and say that chance combining of molecules, you know, a volcano, a lava flow going through a junkyard or going through a, you know, a 
any kind of an environment could possibly produce a machine. Machines are the result of thought, concept, information, and design. Now, let's talk about Darwinian evolution, and we'll finish. Darwin did not invent the theory of evolution. He actually borrowed it from many people that came before him. And as I mentioned, Anaximander in the 6th century BC actually came up with the idea that we had evolved from non-living inanimate chemicals. But Darwin is credited with the idea of promoting a mechanism for the possible evolution of life. And what Darwin's theory basically says is that all of the traits that living, system, living systems possess are inheritable. They can be passed from generation to generation. Those traits are also mutable. That is, they can be changed by an unknown mechanism at that time. He said that certain mutations will increase the ability of an organism to, to acquire resources and live to the age of reproductive maturity. It will increase its fitness, its ability to compete for resources and reproductive mates. And these mutations are passed to subsequent generations and over thousands and millions of generations, Darwin envisioned not only the production of new structures, but entirely new species through this process. Because these mutations, he said certain mutations would be beneficial, they would be concentrated in a population. In effect, he said nature would select those organisms which have the most favorable combinations of traits, allowing them to, in effect, compete more effectively for resources and for reproductive mates. And eventually millions and millions of new beneficial mutations would produce new adaptations and ultimately entirely new organisms. That's Darwin, Darwin, Darwinian evolution, Darwin's theory in a nutshell. Well, let's talk about some of the problems with Darwinian evolution. When you look at living systems, you see that living systems have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of integrated systems. And all of the systems are, have subsystems and subsystems and subsystems that are all integrated, all functioning like an orchestra to allow the organism to survive, reproduce, and uh, compete in its environment. These subsystems are required for them to function at all. I mentioned to you that the visual system has dozens of small systems that are subsystems of the visual system and that all of those systems have to be functional or the visual system will not function at all. A partially evolved visual system does not provide partial vision, it provides no vision at all. And that's one of the great problems, the great mysteries that Darwin faced. Let me read you a quote here. This is from Gertrude Hemmelfarb. She's a molecular biologist. She said, the eye, as one of the most complex organs, has been the symbol and archetype of Darwin's dilemma. Since the eye is obviously of no use at all, except in its final, complete form, how could natural selection have functioned in those initial stages of its evolution, when the variations had no possible survival value? No single variation, indeed no single part, being of any use without every other. And natural selection, presuming no knowledge of the ultimate end or purpose of the organ, the criterion of utility or survival would seem to be irrelevant. What she's saying here, folks, is that... Let me use an example that Chuck Smith has used many times. Let's imagine the primordial worm 800 million years ago. There was a worm that had a baby, bunch of baby worms. And on these baby worms, there was a mutation that occurred that caused a baby worm to have two little brown fleck freckles on its forehead. Those freckles were the early stages of the development of a retina that would ultimately allow the worm to see. The question is, could those baby worms with those little brown spots on the forehead, could they see? No. Why? Because those pigment spots had not yet been, yet, not yet been connected to the brain. So the mutations that gave rise to those pigment spots, did they increase the worm's ability to compete for resources or reproductive mates? No. So they're not concentrated in the population. Well, let's imagine a series of mutations over thousands of generations in worms that ultimately produce two perfectly beautiful eyeballs on the top of a worm. Okay? But those eyeballs are not connected to the brain by an optic nerve. Can the worms see? No. Why? because the camera is not connected to the computer. 
So the mutations that gave rise to this unlikely eyeball do not increase the fitness of the organism, do not increase its ability to compete for resources or reproductive mates. And so those mutations are not concentrated in the population. They're lost. And it's the great problem of Darwinism. I had a professor. I've told this story here before, but I had a professor one time who was a patient of mine that came in for a physical. He was reading Darwin's Origin of Species. And I said, all right, Lord, thank you. <laughs> this guy was the head of evolutionary biology at a major university in Southern California. And after the physical, I said to him, I said, you know what? I said, I'm a skeptic. <laughs> I'm a skeptic. I didn't say I'm a Bible-thumping fundamentalist creation. I said, I'm a skeptic. <laughs> I said, I said, you're an evolutionist. I said, can you explain to me how a system like the visual system, which has multiple dozens of subsystems, all of which must be there in order for the total system to function, how such a system could be produced over millions of years of piecemeal evolution, that is, piecemeal means step-by-step -step evolution, when the mutations that gave rise to the early stages of those subsystems did not increase the fitness of the organism or its ability to compete for resources. And he said, uh, uh, <clears throat> you've got a good point there. He said, we do have primitive visual systems. I said, well, for example, he said, the horseshoe crab. And I said, you're right, the horseshoe crab does have a primitive visual system, but it's got all of the subsystems necessary to produce vision. It's got a device which receives photons and converts it to electrons. It's got a wire that sends the signal to the brain and a brain that's attached to the wire that interprets the information so that the horseshoe crab can say, it's dark outside or it's light outside. Now, it can't discern as well as you and I can visually, but it's got, in theory, a complete visual system. He didn't have an answer. In fact, no one has an answer. Not Stephen Jay Gould, not Richard Dawkins, no professor anywhere that I've met has ever been able to give an adequate explanation for this problem. It is the great stumbling block of evolution. Arthur Kestler, in his book, The Ghost in the Machine, said this, each mutation occurring alone would be wiped out before it be, could be combined with the others. They are all interdependent. The doctrine that their coming together was due to a series of blind coincidences is an affront not only to common sense, but to the basic principles of scientific explanation. And Charles Darwin, in his own book, Origin of Species, on page 75, said, to suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. He saw the problem. He saw the problem. That functional systems with dozens of subsystems, when all of the systems are required to be there, that evolution cannot explain the origin of such systems. Daniel Brook in the journal Science, volume, 17, volume 217, page 24, said, Natural selection may have a stabilizing effect, but it does not prov promote speciation. It is not a creative force, as many people have suggested. Stephen Jay Gould, a man who despises, he loathes creationists, He's a paleontologist at Harvard University, one of the most famous evolution, probably the most famous evolutionist in America. In his, artic in his uh, article, The Return of Hopeful Monsters in Natural History, volume 86, said, speaking about this problem, of what possible use are the imperfect, incipient, that is, transitional, stages of useful structures? What good is half a jaw or half a wing? Good point, Stephen. And yet, he still clings to evolution. Michael Denton, in his book, Evolution, of Theory, and Quite Crisis, said this. If we are to, assume, are to assume that living things are machines for the purpose of description, research, and analysis, and for the purposes of rational and objective debate, as argued by Michael Pollyani and Jacques Manaud, among many others, there can be nothing logically inconsistent, as William Paley would have argued, in extending the usefulness of the analogy to include an explanation for their origin. In other words, if living systems are machines by analogy, and if machines require a creator, then living machines must require a creator as well. He says on page 341, the conclusion may have religious implications. <laughs> 
Indeed it does. Indeed it does. And the Bible says that you and I are wonderfully designed dirt clods. Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Incredible. Incredible. You know, everybody that's here tonight, myself included, and everybody that might see this video or hear this tape, is looking for ultimate answers. Ultimate answers like, why are we here? What is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of existence? Is there meaning to life? All of us are looking. Atheists, philosophers, will tell you flat out that if there is no God, there is no meaning to life. They will say that the lack of existence of God means that meaning is what we make of life. We assign our own meaning to life. But if there is a God, if there is a creator, if there is a designer, it means that there's also a purpose for design, a purpose for creating us. And the Bible, indeed, and the evidence I've shown this morning, indeed, I believe, convincingly shows that there had to be a mind behind creation. And where there is a mind, there is a person. And where there is a person, there is one who willed and had a purpose for our existence. And basically, it comes down to we were created by God, according to the Bible, for his good pleasure. We were created by God to be loved and to love. We were created in such a way that we have the capacity of choice to love and serve God or the capacity of choice to hate and despise and say that he doesn't exist. We were created for love. And then the Bible says that that very creator, who is a personal being and created us to be loved, loved us before we loved him so much that he sent his only begotten son in the person of Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, to come into space and time, to die on that Roman cross, to pay the penalty for our iniquities, our sins, our evil choices, which were the result of the way he created us in the first place. I was talking about many of these things with a man who came to my house last summer to do some construction work. And I was walking him through all these different evidences. And I told him that the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And he said, it's not fair. It's not fair. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's not fair that I should have to suffer the penalty for my sins. I didn't choose to make myself this way with this capacity of choice. It's not fair. And then I had an S mail. You know, there's regular mail, then there's E mail, and there's S mail, which is spiritual mail. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, well, what would be fair, sir? And he thought and he thought and he couldn't have an answer. And I said, well, how about this? How about this? I said, since God's the one that made you, created you with this capacity of choice, this capacity to do good and to serve him or the capacity to reject him or the capacity to do evil. Since God is the one that made you with this capacity of choice and this capacity to do evil, I said, would it be fair, say, if God paid the penalty for your sins? He goes, yeah, that would be fair. God should have to pay the penalty for my sins. And I said, gotcha. Bingo. You see, that was what it was all about, people. God created us for love, to love, to be loved. And then so that we couldn't look up and say, it's not fair. He paid the penalty for our sinfulness, which was the result of the way he created us with his capacity of choice by revealing ultimate love by sending his son to die on the cross for us. What a beautiful picture. It gives meaning to life to understand the nature of our origin, the nature of the creator, the nature of God's love, the nature of the meaning of life, the purpose of life. All of this falls together so beautifully. It has changed my life, and I know it's changed the lives of many of you here. What a great creator and a great savior we have in Jesus Christ. Let's pray.